All right, guys. Well, I just want to start off by thanking all of you for coming out here today. Uh, I put my over-under at about 6, knowing when I was going up against Cal Dietz at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. So the fact that you know some of you guys made it out of bed this morning on the second day, I really appreciate that. Uh, today we're going to talk about corrective exercise. And what I would like to do is, if nothing else, get your guys' brains going a little bit this morning and maybe challenge some of your thoughts or preconceived notions when it comes to corrective exercise. And there's no better way to do that than for you guys to have a little bit of understanding of who I am as an athlete and as a coach. So you guys can see scrawny number 14 in the front row. Like every kid from Indiana, I grew up loving basketball. I grew up in the country, and I remember going out in my gravel driveway, it's the middle of winter, shooting hoops with mittens on because it was so cold outside or going in with my father who worked at Ball State when I was a middle and high school uh, age athlete. And I would go in and just work on my game day after day after day, whether it was ball handling, shooting drills, trying to become the best basketball player possible. And my end goal at you know, 13, 14, 15 years old was to become a basketball coach. So I feel like coaching has always been in my blood. And I remember being 13, 14 years old, and I'm gonna date myself here, but I used to record all the best basketball games with my VHS tapes, okay? So here I am, 13, 14 years old, I'm recording IU versus Michigan when they're in the top five. And I'm watching the great Pacers versus Knicks rivalry games. And you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I'm 13, 14 years old and I'm breaking down game film, okay? You know, watching offenses, watching defenses, watching shooting mechanics because I was so enamored with the sport. And it was frustrating to me because over the course of my high school career, I had uh, another prodigy from, I, or from Indiana, which is Bob Knight. My high school coach loved Bob Knight. So if you guys know anything about Bob Knight, all the highlights that you see, that's real life. So that was my high school coach, very, very tightly wound. You know, Every single practice, he's running, he's yelling, he's screaming, he's throwing basketballs at us. So by the time I'm a senior in high school, I hate basketball. But as I was growing up, I realized, hey, this strength training stuff is kind of cool. You know, I go in the gym, and as a freshman or sophomore, I'm just getting dominated by bigger kids. The, the juniors and the seniors, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're taking me in the post, they're abusing me. So I realized, hey, maybe I need to do some of the strength training stuff too. And as I started to get bigger and stronger, as I became a junior and a senior, and I started to fill out a little bit, it's like, hey, you know, these kids, they're not pushing me around anymore. I've got a little bit more zip on my passes. I've got a little bit more range on my jump shot. So as my love for basketball waned a little bit, my love for strength training grew. So it made sense at that point in time uh, to declare uh, as a freshman in college. I declared for an exercise science major. And what do you do when you don't know what you want to do in life? You do more school, right? So I enlisted, I did a master's program at Ball State, and that started kind of my journey as a strength coach or as a physical preparation coach. When I was at Ball State, I spent two years in the biomechanics lab there, so I did research on strength and power development, and at that same time, I was an assistant strength coach. So I got to work with our football team, our men's and women's volleyball team, our women's soccer team, and I really loved the fact that I could meld two things that I was incredibly passionate about in life those being athletic development and strength training. So it only made sense coming out of Ball State that I was gonna get a job as a Division I strength coach. Like that's where I had my head, that's all I wanted to do. Unfortunately, I didn't get a job there. I got a job at a place called the Athletic Performance Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Sounds pretty cool, right? Go in every day, work with athletes. And unfortunately, it was anything but that. I ended up working in a chiropractic facility and I basically treated people with back pain, knee pain, or shoulder pain on any given day. So it wasn't my ideal gig, but it gave me an understanding, it gave me a foundation for what we would now call corrective exercise. The bottom line was every day I went in and I had to assess and treat people in pain. So when I left that job at Fort Wayne, I took a position here in Indianapolis. I did one-on-one -on -one in home personal training. I was also the head strength coach at a very small high school here called University High School. And then when I got tired of driving around and working 16-hour days, 
my business partner and I, Bill Hartman, opened a small gym called Indianapolis Fitness and Sports Training. So I tell you all this to show you guys I've been at virtually every stop in the food chain. High school, you know, college age kids. I've worked in rehab. I've worked in personal training. I've worked in large group environments. And now at Indianapolis Fitness and Sports Training, we're really well known for small groups, two to four at a time. But I'm very lucky I get to work with some very elite athletes. Um, you know, a lot of people always want to say, well, who do you work with? You know, what are you doing? Um, this past offseason, I got to train Roy Hibbert from the Indiana Pacers. Uh, on the right, you have Chad Marshall, who's the two-time MOS Defender of the Year. Down below, you've got Lori Lindsay from the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team. So I'm incredibly blessed, and I get to do what I do with elite and professional athletes every single day. So that leads us to the question for you guys, what is corrective exercise to you? When you guys hear the term corrective exercise, what do you immediately think of? And by no, no fault of your own, it wouldn't be surprising if you immediately think of foam rolling, maybe some static stretching or some mobilization drills. And of course, it's not truly corrective unless you throw in the ever popular core and glute activation circuits, right? You guys picking up sarcasm a little bit here? I know it's early, okay? This is what bugs me when people talk about corrective exercise. And if Scott hadn't asked me to talk about corrective exercise, I would not be here because it has been my goal to stop talking about corrective exercise for the last two years, because I hate the term. So when people talk about corrective exercise, and this is all they think of, I decided to create my own definition of corrective exercise. So I'm gonna read it to you here, and then we'll break down the key terms or the phrases in red, because I think they're really, really critical. Corrective exercise is a holistic approach where an assessment is used to determine specific weaknesses and or limitations of the athlete. This assessment drives the programming process where a systematic and progressive approach is used to reduce the likelihood of injury and improve performance. Yes, it is a mouthful, okay? But think about all this for a minute. Holistic. If you came into our gym, you would see all kinds of different exercise modalities and exercise mediums, because I don't care. I don't care if it's a dumbbell, a barbell, a kettlebell. If it works, I'm going to use it. Second, the assessment process. This is absolutely critical to what we do. I love the saying, if you're not assessing, you're guessing. I'm a firm believer in that, because your assessment drives what you do with your client or your athlete. Without an assessment, you don't know what their specific weaknesses and or limitations are. Then from there, it is not Mike's magic wheel of exercises. I don't just spin the wheel and choose exercises or set rep schemes. We have a systematic approach to program design, to progressing or regressing a client or athlete. So we give them the best possible training experience. Because in the end, I think if we're doing truly corrective exercise, if we understand movement and biomechanics and physiology, two things happen at the same time. We reduce the likelihood of injury and we improve performance simultaneously. Too often, people think these are mutually exclusive goals. Well, either you keep them healthy or you make them beasts on the field. And I don't agree with that. I think if you do smart training on a day-to-day -day basis, if you understand Movement, biomechanics, and physiology, you can absolutely do both at the same time. So in my world, corrective exercise can be just about anything. It depends on what the client or athlete in front of you needs. Maybe it's foam rolling, maybe it's mobility drills, maybe it's conditioning, maybe they fatigue too fast and that's why they're getting injured or they're not performing at the level that you want. So really, anything on this list could be considered corrective exercise. Now, no sooner do I say that than you go to the ever popular YouTube and you find a demonstration on how to perform a lat pulldown. I'll let you guys uh, judge for yourself the quality of this guy's technique.
So you guys tell me, is that corrective? I think not, okay? So the question that you guys are probably thinking, every person wants to ask me, well, how do you know what needs to be corrected? Hopefully you know it is not that gentleman doing his lap pull downs in a circle around the gym. So again, let me give you a little bit of my philosophy and a little bit of where I think we need to be taking our athletes. Are you guys familiar with Gray Cook's performance pyramids at all? I'm gonna give you a little insight into how I look at these or how I interpret these. And a balanced athlete comes to us with what we would call a strong or broad movement base. So if you think about a really strong pyramid, it's got a strong base and that is movement. Can you mobilize the appropriate joints? Can you stabilize appropriate joints? More specific to what we do as athletes or as coaches, can they squat? Can they push up? Can they hinge? Because I tell you what, if you guys work with young kids, you know a lot of kids don't even have this anymore. They can't do basic movement patterns. Once you have a strong movement foundation, then you move them into the gym or onto the field. And this is where you get to do all the fun stuff that we get excited about, right? Speed training, agility, strength, power, conditioning. But you have to move well before you move more weight or before you move more. And then at the end or at the top, you have functional skill. So this is what our sport coaches are there for. Being able to kick a soccer ball, being able to hit a baseball, being able to throw a football. But it all hinges around the understanding that if you have a strong movement foundation, you can build a better athlete. Now, unfortunately, we all know a lot of the athletes that we get don't look like this. With a lot of the younger kids that I train, this is about 80 to 90% of the young boys that come into my gym. Horrible movement foundation or very small with undeveloped movement foundations, yet somewhere along the way, either a strength coach or a performance coach or their sport coach has said, well, you need to get bigger and stronger. So they don't move well, but now they're in their gym, they're power cleaning, they're squatting, they're bench pressing, they're running gassers three, four, five days a week. So essentially, they're trying to build performance on top of a dysfunctional movement base. And we wonder why these kids get beat up and injured. Well, they don't have a foundation to build upon. So a lot of the guys look like this, and a lot of my young girls look like this. They may have a decent functional movement base. They may lack a little core or trunk stability, but that's an easy fix. Whether it's society, whether it's parents, friends, whatever, a lot of these girls are scared to get in the gym and get after it. I can tell you just about every female athlete that I've worked with, at some point in time, I've had to harp on them to put more weight on the bar. And if you guys have been in the industry long enough, you've seen the same thing, the same phenomenon. You gotta push it a little bit, okay? But it all hinges on the movement base. And if you don't have that, then you can't do all the cool stuff. You can't do the fun stuff. So what we do is really a three-step process. Every single client, gets assessed, they get a customized program, and then we coach them up. And we're gonna dive in here, show you guys exactly kind of how we do this. When it comes to the assessment process, again, one of the first questions people ask us is, with your athletes, what do you assess? And the thing that we're most well known for is our movement or orthopedic screen. It's about 80 tests, and the way I describe it to somebody that's new in our gym, it is literally everything from your big toe up to your head. We're gonna watch you move. We're gonna do isolated muscle or movement testing. We're gonna do isolated joint mobility tests, flexibility tests, because I wanna know how everything moves, not only as a unit, but in isolation, because that can allow me to build a better program for my clients. The stuff that you guys are probably a little bit more passionate about is coaches. Speed and agility work, power, strength, conditioning, all the cool stuff, right? So let's dive in and talk about those things. When it comes to speed and agility training, some of the basic tests that we like to use, 
We like to look at, if we're looking at a more broad scale, either linear speed and agility or lateral speed and agility. So everybody likes to talk about 10s and 40s and that sort of thing. As an example, I'm working with a guy who played in the CFL. Uh, he wants to break into the NFL at some point in time. It's really easy for me because a scout or a coach will tell you he needs a faster 10 or he needs a faster 40. How many of you work in like Division I where you got a lot of athletes that you have to move through a program? A handful? So for you guys, you may not have the time to work with each kid individually or create a customized program. If that's the case, put them in buckets. You know, a very easy technique that I learned from Darcy Norman of Athletes Performance, they group all their kids or all the guys that come through their system into one of three groups. Either they're going to be linear acceleration, so they need to work on like their 10 or their 20. They're going to be more of a max speed type client, so 40s and 60s. Or it's going to be lateral agility, so somebody that needs to work on a 5-10-5 or a cone drill or something of that nature. But when you look at all these things with your athletes, it gives you a really strong understanding of what does this client do well? What do we need to work on to get their game to the next level? Second, I'm a big believer that we have to test power, right? I'm a power lifter by heart and by trade because I grew up power lifting. But when it comes to sports, we all know that power is king. And it doesn't matter how strong you are, if you can't express that quickly on the field, you're probably going to struggle. So depending on what you're comfortable with, we'll test an Olympic lift, you know, a clean and jerk or a snatch, if the athlete themselves is comfortable with it. But a lot of the people that we get, I get for a very short period of time. I may get them for eight weeks or 12 weeks. So if that's the case, I like to use easier tests, things that are harder to screw up, and that don't require quite as much technique, simply because I don't always have the amount of time necessary to make sure they're up to snuff. So if that's the case, I'm going to look at a counter movement jump versus a squat jump, because that'll give me some ideas as to how they utilize elastic energy. Are they more of a tendon and stretch shortening cycle jumper, or are they more of a power jumper, where they just rely on their strength? I love looking at the broad jump, and a lot of people are confused or they don't like the broad jump as well, but I think when you look at the differences between a vertical jump and a broad jump, vertical jump gives you a really strong idea of anterior chain power versus the broad jump, which is very hip dominant, is going to give you a strong idea of posterior chain strength or power development. And then what we actually like to use for upper body power is what's called a long seated med ball throw. So you put a client on their, on their butt, legs straight out in front of them, 10 pound med ball, throw it as far as you can. So these are some of the things that we test to get an idea of a athlete's power development. When it comes to strength, some of the basics that everybody likes to test, a squat, a bench press, a deadlift, a chin-up. Now, again, people like to argue about, well, what do you use, a 1RM, a 3RM, a 5RM, whatever you are most comfortable with, because you are their coach. And I've seen arguments for and against every single one. Some people will say, well, you're more likely to get injured on a 3RM because you're fatigued. Some people will say, well, you're more likely to get injured on a 1RM. It doesn't matter, guys. What matters is what you're most comfortable with as a coach, and what they are most comfortable with as an athlete. When you guys work together to figure out their limitations, it's really simple. But you have to have those conversations with your athletes. Now, what's exciting to me is the conditioning piece. Because I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the sport coaches that I've dealt with over the years have a very poor understanding of physiology. You know, their belief is that hard work equals conditioned athletes. They're going to run them out, and they're going to do gassers, and they're going to do a lot of glycolytic or anaerobic type conditioning work. And if you work with team sports athletes, you know, the glycolytic component tends to be very, very small. So for our athletes, when we're assessing them, first thing that we look at is resting heart rate. And I've had soccer players, for instance, who should have great aerobic development with resting heart rates in the 70s and 80s. So if you guys think about that, that's basically a deconditioned person that's being asked to go outside and run around for 90 minutes on the pitch. So resting heart rate is the first thing. And 60 is our cutoff. 
If somebody's got a decent level of aerobic fitness, they should be below 60. And if not, that's probably something that we're gonna address. The other thing that's cool about that, not just aerobic fitness, but the autonomic nervous system. When you guys start looking at, is this client more sympathetic dominant or more parasympathetic dominant? I tell you what, if a client or an athlete is in the 70s or 80s with their resting heart rate, they're sympathetic dominant. And you're gonna have to figure out ways to either improve their aerobic development and or get them to chill out more. This is also the kid that's always stressed out, high anxiety, you know, caffeine all day long. But resting heart rate, it sounds super simple, but it gives you a ton of feedback as to how this athlete is gonna perform on the field or on the court. Second, I'm a big believer in what's called a one minute go test. And if you've ever done this with your athletes, they are going to hate you for it. Put them on a treadmill, put them on a track, put them on a Schwinn Airdyne, and they have to go as hard as they can for one minute straight. So you're not only tracking how far they go and how high their heart rate gets up to, but most importantly, you're tracking what's called their heart rate recovery. How quickly can they get back down below 130 beats per minute? And if it's taking them two and a half, three, three and a half minutes, that's something that needs to improve. Because again, if they're running around out on the field and they're at you know, 160 beats per minute, two minutes after they've done a big run, you know, that person is gassed and they're not gonna perform well. I'm also a big believer in a modified Cooper's test. So instead of the 12 minute traditional Cooper's test, we go six minutes, go as hard as they can, and we track their heart rate over the course of that six minute time period. When you get their average heart rate over six minutes, it gives you a pretty strong idea of their anaerobic threshold. And again, I'm not a scientist, I don't claim to be, you know, I'm not putting them on metabolic carts, but this gives us a pretty good idea of their anaerobic threshold and where we need to train them if we wanna drive their anaerobic threshold up over their off-season training. And then last but not least, the old school push-ups in a minute test. If you just wanna get an idea of somebody's basic upper body endurance, this is a pretty good test. And again, I work mostly with like soccer and basketball and football, so I don't do this quite as often, but if you work with wrestlers or grapplers or MMA fighters, this could be something that you guys choose to use. So next question becomes, I've got all this data, all right? So I've watched them move. I've got their speed, their power, their agility, their strength, their conditioning. What do I do with it? And I tell you what, the first time Bill Hartman showed me his assessment and showed me all these tests and sent me like a write-up on it, I was totally overwhelmed. The analogy that we use is drinking water from a fire hose, okay? You guys have that visual, because it's so much information. But what you guys need to do is what you guys do every single day as coaches. You guys have an idea of where this client is right now and where you want them to be. So you take this information and you ask yourself, what kind of athlete do I have in front of me right now? What do they do well? More importantly, what do they struggle with? What is holding them back from becoming the type of client I want them to be? And then from there, it's really simple. You create a program from A to B. But you have to have those limitations. You have to understand their weaknesses first and foremost. Because if you don't do that, you're just guessing. If you assume everybody is weak and lacks power, that's great. But you know, there's one really big, strong kid that's not getting anything out of that program. Last but not least, and this is really prevalent in my world, we're at MLS off-season. Uh, for example, I had one kid this year for seven weeks. So I got him like first week in December and he reported this week. So January 9th, he flew back to Seattle. So as you guys can imagine, there's all kinds of things I wanna work on, but I have to be really realistic in the amount of time that I have to work with him and the amount of time I have to impact change. So seven weeks, I'm not getting a whole lot done. He's got an accumulation phase and he's got a strength and power phase and he's back at camp. So I would ask you guys, you know, be realistic in the amount of time you have with your kids. And never forget that our functional movement base is where we need to start. So that's why I always talk about movement is the foundation. If I can teach a client, even in a month, to move better, if I can get them to learn how to exhale, if I can teach them to stop using their hip flexors and their lower back for every single thing that they do, 
if I can get their rib cage to open up and move more appropriately, they're going to be better at their sport. All right? And I can, I can do that very, very quickly. Three, four weeks, I can start to make changes. And I've got a great example. Last year, I was working with the number five ranked basketball recruit in the nation. The kid's an absolute monster. All right? And when we brought him in and we evaluated him, you know, didn't move particularly well. You know, dysfunction, asymmetries all over the place. And we flat out told him, like, look, if you don't fix some of these things, you're at risk for some kind of serious ache, pain, or boo-boo. We never try and predict which joint it's going to be. But based on how he moved, we said, you will have issues if you don't fix this stuff. Did not stick with us. And later that year, had a very, very big scare, sprained his MCL, but it very easily could have been a torn MCL, torn ACL, all that good stuff. And that's not good when your entire livelihood, you could set up your entire family for life based on your ability to play basketball. So I always try and impress upon the clients and athletes that I work with that movement is the foundation. And I want to chase the low-hanging fruit first. Because if I can just get you to move better in three, four weeks, chances are whatever you want to do, whatever other quality you're chasing, whether it's speed, strength, power, conditioning, I can make you better at it just by helping you move better and more efficiently. So after we have assessed our clients, the next thing that we do is we drive a program or we build a program that is custom built for them. And what we have done or what we've created is what we call the R7 approach to training. Now, I do not claim any of this stuff to be new, but what I will tell you is the R7 approach has done two things for us. Number one, we have five coaches on staff at our gym, including Bill and myself. So that's five people writing programs. And based on where you guys are at, you may have way more than that. You could have 10 or 15 different coaches all writing programs for different teams or different athletes. So do you really want every single coach writing programs differently? Probably not. You guys want to have a streamlined approach so that if 10 different athletes all got together and looked at their programs, they would say, oh yeah, this all looks pretty similar. But the other reason we've done this is very, very selfish. It is for client and athlete buy-in. You guys all know if an athlete buys into the program, you are good as gold because they're going to work harder. They're going to get more out of it. Well, if you came to IFAST three years ago and you picked up a Bill Hartman or Mike Robertson program, at the top, the first thing that it said was soft tissue mobilization. Now, you guys are probably in like the top 5% of coaches because you're here today at 8 a.m. Who in here can tell me what soft tissue mobilization is? Come on, guys. Anybody? Okay. So like foam rolling, right? Okay. But out of all of you, one person either knew the answer or was willing to answer the question, right? So imagine being a lay person off the street and you're like, oh, soft tissue mobilization. They had no clue what we were talking about. So the reason we created this R7 approach is to help our clients and athletes understand what we are trying to do. When you hear the word reset or release, it creates almost an emotional response. Oh yeah, you know, uh, the release portion. I lay on that black foam thing and I roll side to side and it hurts like hell, but as soon as I stand up, you know, my knee is moving better and I've got more flexibility. That's the whole goal of this. I want it to be something that they can remember and something that will help them buy into or better understand what it is we're trying to do. So we'll cover all of these, but the R7 approach in order is release, reset, readiness, reactive, resistance, regenerate, recover. And it doesn't matter whether our athlete is 16 years old playing in high school they're a professional athlete, and we've got some old people that come into our gym, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old. They all follow the same template. Now, granted, our 80-year-old doctor that comes into our gym is probably not doing high-level box jumps or plyos. But we're always trying to build our programs on this basic template. And I think this kind of graph or this kind of uh, graphic will help you guys better understand what it is we're trying to do. 
You don't walk into the gym unless you've just drank three cups of coffee and listened to Pantera the entire way in. You don't just go in and start banging out 405 on squats, right? There's a ramping up process. So we're gonna foam roll a little bit. We're gonna do some of our resets. And then we're gonna start to build up. We're gonna do our readiness exercises. We're gonna go through that dynamic warm up, get our core temperature up, get our nervous system firing. And then when we're peaked out and we're ready to go, that's when we're working on technique. We're gonna work on speed, agility, power. We're gonna hit strength. On the back end, as we're starting to fatigue a little bit, we're gonna work on conditioning. And then when we walk out of the gym, we wanna start the recovery process. So let's look at each of these. And I'm gonna give you guys some, some ideas or insight as to how we program for our clients and athletes. Whether you guys choose to use this exact model or not, does not bother me. But hopefully the concepts will help you guys better program for your athletes each and every day. So the first thing that we do is a release. And it doesn't matter foam roller, massage, uh, stick work, cross ball, whatever you guys have access to, essentially we are trying to decrease tone in specific areas of the body. As soon as you jump on that foam roller, your body says, oh man, it's tight, you know? And it triggers your brain, and your brain says, okay, that's tight, I'm gonna chill that out a little bit, okay? So it's much more nervous system driven than we probably ever gave it credit for. If you would've asked me five years ago, oh yeah, we're tearing down adhesions and scar tissue, I don't buy that. We are impacting the brain. And as you guys know, if you guys wanna build bigger, faster, stronger athletes, it starts here and works its way downward. As far as the practical side of it, we generally only give three to five areas max. And reason being, have you guys ever had that client or athlete that comes in and they're on the foam roller and it's like they're going through all the motions and they're in there 30 minutes later and they're still going through their foam rolling circuit? promise you, one of the first kids that I had come into our gym used to tell me, man, Mike, this workout, it just takes way too long, way too long. And literally that day, I took a gym boss timer, put it on 30 seconds. I made him go through his entire foam rolling session like that. He was through his entire warm-up in about 10 minutes because he was just sitting there and he was coming off work and he's, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, he's still rolling himself out, all right? I get it, you're trying to relax, but there's also gotta be some pace or tempo to it. Next, we have what's called our reset. And I have no idea why this is not up here right now. But all a reset is, is something that is trying to get a joint back to a neutral position. If you guys work with athletes, and I'm gonna talk about this in my hands-on later on, virtually every athlete that we have walk in our door walks in with some semblance of this posture. Right? They're all here. They've all got weak abs, their hip flexors, their lower backs. They're in this scissored posture all day, every day. So what we used to do was we'd create these really elaborate programs and we'd be static stretching and activating and doing all these things and we'd get a change. But it took far too long, at least in my opinion. And it didn't always stick. So I would ask you guys to write this down. If you guys are interested in resets, Write down Postural Restoration Institute. They are physical therapists, and they look at the world through a physical therapy lens, but they are the absolute best when it comes to resetting a joint. Because what used to take me three months to improve now takes me three minutes. Think about it like this. If you guys are going to take your car across the country, or you're going to take it out on the Indy 500 track, you want that car to be lined up, right? It's the same thing for my clients and athletes. I wanna restore a more neutral position through their thorax, through their pelvis, before they go out and they start warming up or before they start loading their bodies. So all a reset does is it optimizes the position of specific joints so that I can get my clients moving and feeling better. Third, we have what's called our readiness component. And this is what you guys are already doing, right? A lot of times it's six to eight movements. If it's a more corrective warm up, we may be working on breathing. We may be working on abdominal or core strength or positioning. We may be working on just the basic stuff like groiners and walking Spider-Man and high knees and that sort of thing. A lot of times the, the corrective component of it or trying to get somebody in a better position is about six to eight exercises. 
and then we'll move them into something more dynamic and more progressive. But I always take this opportunity early on, the warm up and that movement foundation can absolutely be built very early in the program. Next is where we get to all the fun stuff, right? We can do reactive work. And the goal here is very simple. We want to improve speed, agility, power, explosiveness, whatever you guys are already using. Now, one thing that I see with a lot of programs, and it's not saying that you guys do this, but a lot of, especially entry-level coaches, love to throw the kitchen sink at our athletes. You know, when I hear that people are doing hour-long speed and agility sessions, I hate to tell you, about the first 10 to 15 minutes may legitimately be speed and agility. The last 45 is conditioning work. So if you're thinking about something that's very nervous system dominant, like speed training, like agility, like power, you have to do it when you're fresh, and you have to do it up front in your program. So a lot of times, we'll only do three, ex somewhere between one and three exercises. If it's what I would call a more general athletic development program, so like a younger kid, we'll probably throw in a fast foot drill. We'll probably throw in some upper body med ball power work. We may do some jumping or that sort of thing. If it's a higher level athlete, like my combine prep guy, what exa for example, what we're gonna do with him, we're gonna go in for 15, 20 minutes, and we're gonna work on his 10. And I stole this from Lee Taft. I'll take six to eight minutes and just work on rehearsing the drill, or rehearsing one single thing that I want him to improve that day. And then the last eight to 10 minutes is just building out the skill. So it's a short block of rehearsal, and then it's skill-specific training. And then we're getting into the workout. So there's lots of ways you can do this, but I think far too often, if you're giving more than three exercises in this part of the program, you're sacrificing quality for quantity. Next, we have our resistance component. And this is where some people uh, love to badmouth uh, just corrective exercise as a whole, right? They assume that since we do all these things to get people moving and feeling better that we don't actually lift weights. And I don't know if you guys follow Roy Hibbert on Twitter or any of those social media sites, but if you guys saw his vines and his video clips from this offseason, that guy got after it. Even my soccer players that, you know, if we're thinking power, capacity, spectrum, soccer is far more on the capacity spectrum than most team sport athletes. We push, we strength train our guys, especially if I've only got them two months. Because if you don't get strong in that two-month offseason, when are you gonna do it during that 10 week competitive cycle? It's just not happening. So I'm a big believer in getting strong because I think strength has a spillover effect to a lot of other physical qualities. If you're strong, typically you're more powerful, you're, you've got better speed, you've got better agility because really the ability to control and pow powerfully come out of a plant or a cut is largely strength driven. So. If you guys are gonna strength train your athletes, 30 to 40 minutes, you know, if it's a pro athlete, they may go a little bit longer. But again, if you're going 50, 60, 75 minutes with high school age athletes, chances are you're just beating them into the ground. They're not getting enough out of their training. Next, we have the regenerate component. And if you guys wanna put like a line through this and write resiliency, I gotta give a shout out to Donnell Boucher. He took, my, uh, he took my R7 and he said, regenerate, eh, I'm not feeling that. But resiliency, I like that. And I like that too. Because a lot of times when people hear the term regenerate, they think like a flushing workout or something lighter just to get them feeling better. Resiliency, that's awesome. Because that kind of cultivates that warrior mindset, right? The, the ability to constantly get after it, to be resilient even when you're fatigued. So if I can give you guys one thing to think about, is to better understand physiology. And I'm the first to admit, up until about five years ago, my knowledge of physiology was I thought if you did any kind of long duration work, you were gonna look like a marathoner. I thought that high intensity interval training, no, no disrespect, Carwin, sorry. You know, high intensity interval training would cure all ills, you know? And I think I've just evolved, I've grown as a coach, and I've tried to understand physiology better. And what we need to focus on with a lot of our team sports athletes is developing an aerobic foundation first. And there's far more to it than just going out and pounding the pavement for 30, 45, 60 minutes. 
If you guys ever read Joel Jameson's Ultimate MMA Conditioning book, fantastic read. It is not just geared towards MMA training. It is like the textbook that we all wish we had when we were taking physiology in college. So understand what this client or athlete needs. If they're a team sport athlete, they need a strong aerobic engine to recover, to be able to perform at the highest levels and not fatigue. Then last but not least, recovery. And if we can talk autonomic nervous system just for a minute, we all know the sympathetic response, right? Fight or flight. We learned that probably our first day in exercise science. But on the other side of that spectrum is the parasympathetic, the rest and digest. And we have talked so much as an industry about post-workout nutrition, right? How quickly do we need to take that shake in? Is it 15 minutes or is it 15 and a half? You know, how tightly, you know, whatever that window is, we've just beaten this thing against the head. But we never talk about your nervous system, the rest of your body. When you're going through a workout, you are very sympathetic, and that's a good thing. You need that sympathetic system to demonstrate speed, strength, power. But when you're done, can you shut it back off? And a lot of our athletes cannot. They go home, they're toned up, they're stressed, they don't sleep well. They don't eat well, and then it's this vicious cycle. Well, now they're back to see you again the next day. They're still sympathetic. They've not recovered from the last workout. So this is something that we harp on all the, all the time with our athletes, with our clients. When you are done with a workout, we are going to do something to kickstart that recovery process, to get you from a sympathetic toned-up state to a parasympathetic state. Sometimes it's simple as one breathing exercise. And if you've been going hard, and then I make you sit down and do crocodile breathing for three minutes, you will be shocked at how hard it is for you to get your breath, to get a full clean inhale, and most importantly, a full clean exhale. But start to think of it in this fashion. If you guys take nothing away from this, this talk other than this, and you start doing this with all of your clients and athletes, I guarantee they're gonna move and feel better. And I'm going to go kind of light on the coaching portion here, simply because I've got a hands-on later where I'm going to go over a lot of this stuff. But when we're talking about movement correctives, a lot of times, as coaches, and I'm guilty of this in the past as well, once we've shown our athletes the warm-up, we just kind of let them go. And at this point in my career, I realize every single thing that our athletes do is important. So if I'm giving them a leg lowering, and their back is super arched and you know, their body's all over the place and they're unstable, that leg lowering exercise is doing absolutely nothing for them. So not only myself, but my other coaches in my gym, I really harp on them. If we believe in corrective exercise, and if we believe in getting our clients to move and feel better, there is no better time than the warm up to start dialing that process in. As coaches, I think we all know though that really, the coaching starts the second they walk in the gym. If you've done this more than a year or two, chances are you can tell with some degree of confidence when that athlete walks in the door what kind of session they're going to have. You know, if they're in like this and they won't look you in the eye and, you know, they're really lethargic and they're slow to get going, you know, they're messing with their phone or whatever, they're not going to have a great training session. So, even though it's not movement related, the coaching process starts the second your athlete walks in the door. Last but not least, something that I love to talk about is the best angles for coaching. And this is stuff you guys may take for granted, but a lot of young coaches don't have this in their arsenal. I start every training session watching my client from a 90 degree angle. I want to get a side view because that gives me an understanding of their sagittal plane. If they're deadlifting and they're like this, they don't have control over their sagittal plane. And I know other people will argue with me on this, but I firmly believe if you do not have a sagittal plane, you do not have a frontal or a transverse plane that is working optimally. You have to get the sagittal plane first, and that opens up all those other planes of movement. So I always start from the side, and then I'll move to front and back from there. As far as energy system correctives, if I give somebody a specific heart rate, there's a reason for it. If somebody's doing what we call cardiac output work, which is lower level aerobic development, they should be between 120 and 150 beats per minute. If they're at 160, 170, 
they're not getting the adaptation that I want. So we have to monitor heart rate. We have to make sure they're doing things the way that we want them to. Then we have to monitor movement quality too. Because if I give somebody 60 minutes of aerobic development work, whether it's cardiac output, high intensity continuous training, and their knees all over the place, and you know they're just really sloppy with it, I'm reinforcing bad movement and bad posture. So in reality, everything that we do should be corrective. From movement, to biomechanics, to physiology, if you guys have a good understanding of these three pillars, you know, everything that you guys are doing already for your clients and athletes is in reality corrective. 